And all right, hello everyone. We are live. Please refresh your pages. We are live. Please refresh your pages. And could everyone here just do me a big favor and let me know when you can see me and hear me. Or rather, let us know when you can see us and hear us. So when you, uh, let me know in the chat when you're able to see us and hear us. Now I actually ask this because I've had some really bad webinar experiences before where I've like started the webinar as a presenter and then like no one can actually see or hear me. So now I always ask at the beginning and it looks like people can see in here. I said, Josh, Sylvia, fantastic. Now um, we have a pretty special presentation planned today and I want to get a sense for where everyone is joining us from. Um, so could you actually let us know in the chat where in the world are you joining us from? Because Nat, I, I don't know how often you do live broadcasts, but when we do them at Teachable, we get people from you know all over the world. Have you found that to be the case for you? Yep, definitely, uh, which makes it kind of extra fun. I'm always impressed by the people who are up at 2 a.m. somewhere on the other side of the world to join for the broadcast. So it's always fun so to see. Exactly. And we do have folks chiming in from Austin, Texas, San Diego, Pennsylvania, SoCal, Tampa, Florida, Boston, Portugal, Bambindo, Florida, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, sorry, Indiana, Jesus, uh, California, South Africa, Philippines. So really early in the morning for Rolito. Philippines, yeah. <laughs> yeah, New York City, UK. All right, so folks from all over. Now it's 3.01 p.m. for me here in New York. Nat, I think it's 2 for you in, in Austin, or is it yep. it's about time? I think whatever time it is, I think it's time for us to get started. So now I'm going to turn this over to you. Uh, so go ahead and take it away. Sounds great. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today, uh, and Cameron, of course. And today we are going to be going over SEO for passive course sales, uh, your $100,000 blueprint. This is a topic that I'm I don't, I get, like super passionate about. It's something I've always been really interested in. I think SEO, search engine optimization, is an incredibly powerful marketing tool that is unfortunately uh, kind of full of uh, a lot of bullshit and uh, hype and like theatrics, uh, people overcomplicate it, they make a big mess of it and make it seem a lot harder than it is. Um, a little bit of background on me. I'm the founder of a marketing agency called Growth Machine uh, that does SEO and content marketing for a lot of digital technology and e-commerce companies like some of the ones here. Uh, content that we've done across all of our clients is read by some 3 million plus people uh, each month. But most important to this presentation, uh, I am also a teachable course creator. And uh, the most recent course I did called Effortless Output with Rome has sold a bit over $200,000 since I launched at the end of January. And you can see kind of the, the weekly chart here since it launched. And almost all of these sales have come uh, through SEO. So uh, through uh, one primary article on my site and some other content, I've been able to capture a lot of search traffic related to Rome and then funnel that into the course. So what I want to talk a bit about today is how we can cut through some of the noise around SEO show how simple the like foundational first principles of SEO are, and then give you a proven framework for getting started so that you also can capture a bunch of traffic organically uh, and then turn that traffic into sales for your course in pretty much any area you're talking about. Uh, I do also have an SEO course that I'll mention at the end uh, that can help you do this, but also I'm trying to make this straightforward enough that you could do it without the course, just using some free resources. So let's go ahead and dive in. I'm also gonna go ahead and pause a couple times throughout the presentation for questions. So uh, Cameron, will you be able to like field them and send them my way when we get to those points? Yep, absolutely. And I actually, Nat, I hate to cut you off for a second, but I'm going to quickly mm -hmm. share my screen with an important logistical note for everyone because sure. there's always lots of folks who ask this. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Now, when you're watching this, you're, you might be wondering, hey, my screen is a little bit blurry. The, the text is hard to read. You know, how do I make this a little bit bigger or sharper? So the first thing is you can make it sharper. You're watching this video right here. Click the gear icon on the bottom right, and then change the resolution to the highest one, 720p HD. So if you want to make sure that you're watching this in high quality, click the gear icon on the bottom right of the video and change it to 720p HD. If you want to watch it bigger, just hit the full screen icon right next to it to make it full screen. And one important note, there are no bad questions in this webinar, but there is one question that I'm going to answer immediately. So that kind of makes it a bad question, which is that, yes, there will be a replay. So if you ask me that, if you ask Nat that, the answer will be yes, there is a replay. So anyone in the chat, please help me out. If you see somebody ask, will there be a replay? Just type in the chat, let them know. Yes, there will be a replay. That would be a real big assistance. So yeah, those are logistical notes. Uh, sorry for taking over for a sec. 
All good. Those are important notes. Uh, all righty. Now I will share again and we can resume. Okay. So like I said, this is the goal. Uh, we're going to go through it a bit today and then we'll stop for questions along the way. So feel free to keep tossing them as we go and we'll stop at good intervals to go over them. So when we simplify SEO a little bit, we can think of it in two parts. There is the actual strategy. So how you think about SEO, how you think about search engine optimization, how you think about capturing traffic from Google. And then there's the actual execution on that strategy. And these two uh, interplay in a really interesting way in the sense that your strategy alone will not get you anywhere, but you need a really, really good strategy in order for the execution to work because a lot of people end up doing a ton of work on kind of a strategy that's never going to get them anywhere or a lot of, or other people might spend a lot of time on the strategy, but then never fully execute on it. And you really need both of these if you want these kind of like magical course sales from Google to start arriving for uh, whatever you're working on. So we're going to start with the, the strategy side. And I like to make the analogy here of uh, Henry Ford because he has this famous line where he said, you know, if I'd asked the people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Right. And if we're thinking about how Henry Ford might sell cars with SEO, if he went and he started doing research and trying to figure out what people are searching for, he probably would have found that nobody was searching how to buy a car because nobody knew what a car was or they, they didn't even know they wanted a car. Right. What people were looking for were uh, faster horses. Right. There were 100,000 people a month searching for faster horses, but there was nobody searching for how to buy a car. And this is a lot of where the SEO strategy gets uh, kind of intricate because where many people uh, go wrong is they focus on assuming that everyone knows about their product, that everybody knows they want their product, and they just need to put their product out there and people will find it. But in most cases, uh, they don't. Most people don't know they want to buy a car. They think they want to buy fast horses. So you have to figure out how you can reach them and help them solve their problems. And this is really SEO strategy in a nutshell, is finding what your customers' problems are, uh, answering their questions about those problems, and then introducing your product as an even better solution to their problem. And uh, as an example of this, I'm going to uh, point to one of my favorite companies, Zapier. Uh, Zapier is a, a tool that lets you automate uh, your apps and connect workflows between things. And they have a built-in integration with Teachable. So if you're not using Zapier in your Teachable school, uh, you absolutely should because they make it so easy to manage parts of your like student management process, uh, sending follow-up emails, creating different like email funnels for them. It's really, really powerful. And Zapier is this incredible like SEO and marketing example because their blog and their site get about 1.1 million organic visitors per month. This is traffic that they're not paying for. It's traffic that just shows up every month without them really having to do anything except, you know, continuing to do what they do. It's people showing up to articles they might have written five years ago, right? Like I have articles on the Zapier blog that I wrote six years ago that I think still get some traffic, right? And so they're an incredible example of how you can use SEO to actually uh, sell your product and help people discover it, right? But it requires first finding those customer problems that make sense because Zapier is a tool for automating relationships between uh, your different apps, right? So you might think that they're ranking for keywords that have the word like automate, right? Like automated upload to Google Drive or automate, uh, you know, teachable to convert kit. But those aren't their biggest keywords, right? So even though that's what they do, that's not the main thing that they rank on. The big things that they rank on are actually related to like productivity and different kinds of tools. It's people looking for link shorteners or calendar apps or music editing software, note-taking apps, right? These are the terms that people are searching that Zapier has written about that bring people to Zapier's site, right? And you might wonder like, well, those people aren't looking for a Zapier solution right now. They're just looking for the best calendar app. So why would this be valuable for Zapier? Well, that's sort of part two, right? Is if you're, if you know your customers are asking these questions, then when they arrive on your site, when they, you know, get to, uh, you know, reading your material, you can then answer their questions about those problems, right? So you can then say, okay, you want to know about the best calendar app. Uh, I'm going to help answer your question. 
right? So when somebody goes and they search best calendar apps, Zapier shows up here as the first thing below all the ads, right? We've got the mess of ads since Google's kind of a, a landmine of advertising now. Uh, but once you get past those ads, Zapier is the number one result, right? And so they're the thing you're going to click on if you don't want to look at an ad. You're going to look at the 10 best calendar apps of 2020. And then when you click it, you're going to find that they've written this like really, really good in-depth article all about the 10 best calendar apps of 2020. So, so far, really nothing to do with Zapier, right? Somebody searched for best calendar apps uh, and then Zapier has managed to be number one for the term. And then somebody clicks on that result and then they end up on this blog post where they read about the best calendar apps, right? Still not really anything Zapier related, right? Which is why step three is so important. Uh, which is introducing your product as a better solution to their problem. So people are showing up and they're saying like, hey, you know, I'm just looking for a really good calendar app. But what they don't know is that there's a lot of things Zapier can do to make your calendar apps even better, right? Because for example, maybe you'd been using Google Calendar, but you wanted one that could give you like better text message alerts uh, for your upcoming events. Well, it turns out Zapier can just do that for you, right? So as you're reading this article, you're seeing like, oh, I, you know, I am, you know, I'm trying to solve this problem by finding a new app, but it turns out that Zapier can actually do all these things for me. It can text me about calendar events. It can post my Slack about it. It can turn my to-do items into calendar events. You might not have even known what Zapier was, but now in reading this article, you're discovering Zapier as like an even better solution to your problem. Right, so this is where uh, the strategy element is so powerful because if you can figure out what your customers are actually asking uh, and then you can create really good content that answers their questions and then within that content, you can present your product as a solution to their problem, uh, then you've got a really, really powerful SEO strategy, right? So pretty much anybody who's listening uh, who either has a course or who's thinking about a course can use this because there is so much to say uh, related to the problems your customers are trying to solve by buying your course that each topic that they might be searching is potentially an article that you could create to help answer that question, right? So let's imagine for a second that you had a course on uh, wine tasting or like becoming a wine expert, right? Well, obviously you could write articles about wine because I mean, hey, like it's a, it's a wine course, you should write articles about wine. But there's all these other problems that your customers might be trying to solve, right? Like maybe they wanna learn how to give better gifts, right? They're interested in wine because they wanna uh, be able to give uh, better gifts with it. Or people who are interested in gift giving might also be interested in giving someone a wine course, right? So you could write about like giving good gifts, giving gifts to people who are hard to give gifts for, things like that. You could write about hosting parties, right? Because if somebody's interested in hosting parties, they might be interested in improving their wine palette and in getting, you know, a little more cultured and culinary and being able to talk about these things. Uh, somebody who's interested in like healthier drinking, right? This is a big thing right now. We've got low alcohol alcohol. We have alcohol-free alcohol. -free alcohol. Uh, we have stuff like, you know, White Claw and Spike Seltzers, which are, you know, the gluten-free low sugar drinking option. We have like natural and biodynamic wines that are, you know, healthier than traditional wines. Like those are all cool topics you could go after that, again, feed into this like learning more about wine course and sustainable agriculture as well, right? People who are interested in regenerative farming or protecting the environment might be interested in learning more about wine and wine's impact on the environment. And so when you kind of take the time and you say, okay, I have this course on wine, but just trying to rank on topics related to say like, you know, uh, how to learn more about wine, that's gonna be pretty hard, that's gonna be limited. So what is the whole like universe of other things that people who want to learn about wine are interested in and then how do I start writing on some of those other things and collect more and more of this traffic? Because as you branch out, you might discover that some of these other terms are actually uh, really robust and there's a lot of things that you can talk about, right? Even just plugging in uh, sustainable wine as like a root search term. And this tool is called AREF's uh, phenomenal SEO tool. I cover how to use it in the course. I use it for everything. Uh, but just plugging in sustainable wine gives us all these other ideas, right? Like biodynamic wine, environmentally sustainable, organic wine brands, uh, California wines, and like, you know, seeing how those compare to other regions and their environmental impact. There's so much you can do here just by saying, okay, I have this core idea. What other problems 
could I be helping people solve with this course? And then how do I create content that answers all of those people's questions? And if you do that, it's gonna give you that really strong SEO strategy. It's going to give you a really clear roadmap to, again, find those customer problems, uh, answer their questions about those problems, and then introduce your product as the best solution to those problems so that they are naturally going from being curious in one thing to learning about that thing, to seeing how your product helps uh, solve the problem they originally had. Then you're not buying ads, you're not doing like, you know, these really aggressive email sales funnels. You're just very naturally transitioning people from asking a question to finding your course as the answer. Uh, so we're gonna go into execution in a minute, but I wanna pause there and see what questions people have about this initial ideation strategy concept, especially around maybe finding those problems and then how you like segue into, into introducing the solution. Yeah. So there were a couple, a couple questions that I saw come in. So the first one here was from Josh um, and Josh was asking, you know, is there anything that's okay about using, you know, a tool like Ahrefs, if you're going to be doing this sort of keyword research, is there anything wrong with using like their free trials and uh, doing that to avoid paying for expensive SEO tools? I know it's a little bit different than uh, <laughs> the SEO strategy, but that was the first question. And no, I, I actually strongly recommend that. I mean, you can do a lot of this initial research. You know, you can hop into one of their tools, do the seven-day free trial, and get most of the research that you need for a year of writing. Uh, and you can, you know, you can do that with AREFs. You can do that with, there's another tool called Mangools. It's Mangools Keyword Researcher that's significantly cheaper uh, that doesn't have the same powers as AREFs, but is also a really good starting point. Uh, so yeah, don't feel like you have to go out and buy $500 SEO tools to do this. There's a lot of ways you can do it with free trials and get the research done really quickly and then kind of run with it from there. All right. So there are actually two good questions, one from Sarah Don and one from Madison. So Sarah Don says, uh, would this work on YouTube in addition to articles? Like how could I find keywords uh, on there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and we can actually, I can show you this live real quick. If we go here and we go into AREFs and go into the Keyword Explorer here. Uh, so one, uh, it, actually, it actually has YouTube search. So if we were gonna look for biodynamic wine, for example, uh, and this is gonna be like the Google results, right? So 2.2 thousand searches per month. Uh, we can look at the YouTube results too, right? So not as much volume on YouTube, but in my experience, the Google results frequently mirror the YouTube results in the sense that if something is popular on Google, it's probably gonna be fairly popular on YouTube as well. And part of that is uh, that even if something doesn't have a huge amount of search results uh, on, or even if something isn't a huge search term on YouTube, if you made a really good video on biodynamic wine, it would probably pop up here because you've probably seen now that a lot of uh, Google search results pop up videos in the top, right? So if you can create a really good video instead of an article, that video can actually rank uh, on Google as well as YouTube. And it's a really, uh, really powerful way to get traffic, especially since so many people prefer video now. And since obviously you're promoting a video course, having video content is a great way to promote that based on, you know, what people are looking for. All right. That's fantastic. And I guess the last question before we go on here. Um, so Madison says, if I have a course for branding photography, but you could use the fundamentals for other kinds of photography, you know, how would I use this to start thinking about marketing to both kinds of people if the course is targeted towards a specific person? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, what I would probably think about is, you know, so if we look at something like branding photography, uh, there's going to be a bit of search volume, right, on Google. And actually, it's super low difficulty, right? So uh, this, this tells me that even if you have a fairly new, more nascent site, if you wrote something really good about branding photography, maybe and made a video to go with it, so you've got both, and published it, you'd have a very good chance of ranking towards the top of Google for this keyword since it's fairly easy and it's got a decent search volume. So you could be bringing in these 500 people a month to your site and a, a decent number of them might end up buying the course. But then you could also branch off into some of these other areas, right? So we can see uh, what else is, are these terms ranking for, right? So we've got super broad stuff like what is photography and there'd be a lot of photography fundamental stuff you could write about. Uh, and then you might find that over time, 
and we're not going to be able to cover this today, but this is another great way to use SEO. But you might find that as you write or create little videos about other topics related to photography, you might discover other courses that are worth creating. So if you think of your branding photography course as part of a portfolio of courses you are building, then uh, as you're creating the marketing content, like through SEO for it, what stuff does very well and where people are signing up for your email list or asking for more info, that gives you some really good data on what other courses you should create. And then once you create them, you already have the marketing in place for them. That's great. Thanks so much, Nat. Um, now, folks, keep your questions coming. Keep them coming in the chat and I'll be jotting them down to make sure to give to Nat during the next Q&A. Awesome. All right. Hop back in here. Okay. So we went over the strategy part, right? We talked about how, you know, in the beginning, a lot of it is <clears throat> going out and thinking, well, what, what are all of the problems that my customers are trying to solve? And then creating that list and then saying, okay, you know, how do I answer them? And how in answering these, will I be able to kind of like introduce them to my product? Well, the strategy only gets you so far, right? Because you could make this list and then you could never do anything with it. Uh, the execution is really like the meat of it and is kind of like the long, boring part of it. Uh, the strategy is going to take maybe 1% or 0.1% of your time. The execution is going to take the other 99 or 99.9%. .9%. The strategy you can probably do in an afternoon. Execution, you're looking at years, right? To keep doing it, keep doing it consistently. And part of this is because Google is crazy competitive, right? If you're not first, you're last, right? I mean, how many times have you gone to Google and gotten to the bottom and then clicked onto page two, right? Do you do that like once a year? <laughs> I mean, if you get to the bottom of the first page on Google and you haven't found what you're looking for, you typically go to the top and search something else. You don't go to page two, which means that if your article or your video is not in like the top few results, ideally the top five, it's probably not going to get very much traffic, right? It's probably not going to do very well. And so execution is so important because so many people create this great strategy and then they kind of like half-ass a few articles or half-ass a few videos and then they wonder why they're not getting any traffic from it. So it really requires like having a system and putting out really high quality stuff consistently so that you can actually compete, so you can actually execute on your strategy. And the simple version of this is creating really great content, uh, publishing it consistently, and working to increase the authority of your site. So we'll, we'll go through all three of these uh, again, because it, there's a lot of like little stuff uh, beyond this, but if you can just do these three things, you're gonna succeed, like you're gonna be 90, 95% of the way there. Uh, and a lot of other, I think like SEO blogs or SEO courses will overcomplicate it with tons of other things that you need to do. But that's because this stuff is just honestly like very hard, but if you do it, it works super, super well. So let's go through what each of these means. Uh, creating great content is simply uh, writing something or recording a video that is better than the top pieces on Google or YouTube and that fully answers the searcher's query. So what I mean by this is, uh, if it's going to be better than the top pieces, right, it needs to provide more value. It needs to be more entertaining, more succinct. It needs to uh, go into more detail. It needs to have better visual support. It just needs to be better, right? If you look at your piece and then you look at the top three pieces on Google and you go, oh, wow, those are, theirs are like really great, you're going to have a hard time outranking them. Whereas if you read yours and then look at theirs and go, oh my gosh, mine is like so much better, you've got a good shot of beating them. And then fully answering their question means that if somebody reads your post or watches your video, they should not have to go back to Google to read another post or watch another video. Because if they have to go back and find something else, that tells Google that whatever you created did not answer their question, right? It's telling them that, oh, this person only like half answered their question. It wasn't like that great of a piece. And that will actually cause Google to rank your content lower. Whereas if your content is such that people are reading it and then they're not going back, that tells Google that you did a really good job and they should keep giving other people who search the same thing your content as answers, right? So how do you actually create that content that is better and that's not gonna send people back, right? Well, one question or one, one part of it is just the, the like going back to Google test, right? Is saying, okay, is there anything left unanswered here, right? And constantly asking yourself that, saying like, what other questions would somebody have? And this is where talking to your customers, talking to people who are in your courses is so useful because that's gonna give you 
a list of everything that you want to include in these articles or videos to make sure that they're being complete. But you can also go and just look at the competition, right? Check out the top five posts for whatever query you're trying to rank on. If you want to rank on branding photography, right? Look at those first five articles on Google and say, okay, what do all of them include? Like what is in each article that I want to make sure that I include? One easy way to do this is to take all of their H2s and H3s, all of their headings, all their sections, and just make a big bolded list and say, all right, this is what all of the articles talked about. And so which of these do I want to make sure I include so that I'm not leaving anything out? But then you also want to look through and say, what are they leaving out? Right? Like, what are they forgetting? Like, what do I know? What can I bring to this topic that they are not talking about? Because that's where you become extra valuable. That's where you become better than the top ones. Uh, if you can actually bring more to the conversation, if you can add more value than what people are getting from the incumbent pieces, that's when you can really start to take them over. And then once you have that list of everything they're including, that you should add and everything they're not including that you should add, then you can start combining them into uh, what you might call like a mega post, combining the best parts with what they leave out. And that is like a very, very easy, repeatable way to create really, really strong content that has a very high chance of ranking for basically any keyword you want to go after. If you read the first five posts and if you know the area really deeply and you can say, this is important, this is not important, this is missing, and I'm going, to turn it, I'm going to turn all this into something great, you're going to have something really, really strong to work with. But just creating that piece uh, is not enough because a lot of success with SEO is consistent publishing. Uh, the number one reason that I see, uh, or there's two main reasons I see sites fail with SEO. One is their content is not good enough. And two is they did not publish consistently enough. So there's no hard and fast rule, but these are some of the sites that we work with at Growth Machine, right? So going from 200 to about 1,000 visitors per, uh, per week and, you know, over the course of a few months, going from like 400 to almost 2,000, from zero to 1,000, right? Like all of these charts are showing the kind of growth you can have with SEO. This one's a crazy one. It was like 1,000 a week to 32,000 a week. Um, but in all of these cases, you know, the, what's, what's the same is this constant publishing. It's this attention to creating an editorial calendar for yourself and anybody you're working with to make sure that you are not letting your publishing slip. Because a lot of SEO is just staying consistent and continuing to build up a body of work so that Google recognizes your site is like a very good resource on the information that it's trying to rank for, right? And you can get pretty uh, pretty detailed and pretty complex in how you set this up. I mean, this is how we set it up, right? So you can see like <clears throat> week 29, article number two has seven subsets and it's due on June 25th and has this writer. And those are just the stuff that's like not planned yet, right? Like here's the stuff that we're editing. Here's stuff in client review and approved to publish, right? Uh, obviously we're a marketing agency. We have to be super meticulous with all of our processes, but creating some kind of process like this is essential for making sure that you keep publishing because as pretty much anybody who knows, uh, anybody who's tried to do any kind of content marketing, YouTube, blog content, whatever knows, uh, publishing is hard. It's hard to publish on a consistent basis. It's hard to write consistently. It's hard to record consistently. If you are not meticulous in getting stuff out on a regular interval, it will most likely fall through the cracks. So you just want to make sure that uh, you're, you're setting yourself up to succeed by setting a, like a weekly goal, right? Of, okay, I'm going to do two posts a week. I'm going to do one post a week, but I'm going to get it out every day on Wednesday. And if I do more than that, awesome. If, but at least I'll get the one out and then making sure you can stick to that for a long time so that you have the best chance of success. But then the third part uh, that's you know really essential to making the SEO execution work is growing the authority of your site. Because if Google doesn't see your site or you know, also your YouTube channel as a really good source of information, then no matter how good your content is uh, and no matter how consistently you publish, you are just unlikely to ever seriously rank for some of these key terms. So uh, this is a concept we came up with at Growth Machine called the critical authority threshold. And essentially, when a site is just starting out, it might have a lot of potential traffic because it's written a bunch of posts. And if those posts were ranking well, 
the site would get a lot of visitors. But because it's new and it doesn't have much authority, the actual traffic is still very low. Uh, and the actual traffic stays low until you cross this critical authority threshold, which comes from a combination of uh, time, right? So just waiting and being patient and continuing to execute on the plan uh, and then building backlinks to your site. So building backlinks just means getting other sites around the internet to link back to your blog posts or your main site. Uh, this is where you can really make or break your success in SEO. Because if you do your backlinking in a scammy, black hat, sketchy way, you will destroy your site and <laughs> Google will not rank you for anything. Uh, but if you do it in a legitimate, honest way, you can rapidly accelerate the growth uh, of your site. I mean, as one example, this chart that I showed you earlier of a site uh, that had very flat traffic and then suddenly took off, uh, this is from link building, right? They were not doing any kind of link building. They were just publishing. Uh, we eventually kind of talked them into adding more support for their site by doing link building on it. And we started around January and then suddenly that additional authority kicked in and you can see that there's no increase in publishing here. Like it was still just two posts per week through this whole period, but they went from two or 3,000 visitors a day to 32,000 visitors or per week uh, just by building more authority to their site, right? And just, just by uh, adding those links and like showing Google that they were a good source of information. Same with this site, right? And it started off really, really slow. It was getting very little traffic. Uh, traffic was not increasing. And then as soon as they started focusing on building up that authority, uh, they started getting a lot more growth, right? And going out and getting links from other sites is great in the short term for uh, like PR and getting like a burst of traffic and getting some visitors like on that week. But in the long term, since it increases the authority of your site, since it tells Google that, hey, this is a site that's trustworthy, the more of those you can build, the more your traffic can increase, the more there, the more highly your pages are going to rank. Uh, and then obviously, the more highly your pages rank, the more traffic you get, the more traffic you get, the more courses you sell. Uh, it's a really good virtuous cycle. And since SEO compounds, right, since it can kind of keep going up over time, every additional link you build gets like a bigger and bigger impact uh, on like the long-term success and like all the sales you can get down the line. So how do you do it? This is an area where it's like, again, a lot of... SEO blogs like to talk about all the like crazy hacks you can do for link building and building the authority of your site, but most of them don't work. A lot of them will get you in trouble. Uh, it's best to just stick with the safe things that pretty much always worked and will probably pretty much always work in the future, right? So <clears throat> guest posting, uh, finding other blogs in your niche who you can reach out to. You can say, hey, you know, I want to share an article about this thing that I know a lot about and then include a link back to your site. Really, really safe, stable, manageable way to do it. Uh, outreach, right? So reaching out to sites that are linking to competitors' articles when you have a better article and ask them to replace it or reaching out and offering affiliate commissions, things like that for links to you. Uh, that's another great way to do it. And then general PR, right? Uh, trying to get any work that you're doing featured in a publication or in some like journal related to your field or even like your school's alumni newsletter or something like that. Uh, any place that you can get the work you're doing featured is going to help by uh, building more links back to your site. And like these are not sexy tactics. They're not like really fun and cool and uh, super automatable, but they work, right? And they're very unlikely to get punished by Google because you're not breaking the rules here right? It's when people break the rules that they get into a lot of trouble with their SEO. And you could go from 10,000 visitors a day to zero. I've seen it happen before. It sucks, right? So it's not worth playing games and trying to cheat the system. Like do the slow, boring things that work. And over time, uh, the results will kind of speak for themselves. So if you can actually follow this <clears throat> fairly like boring, unsexy strategy of, you know, designing all the things that you should be going after and then creating really good articles on them on a consistent schedule and building the authority for your site, it's pretty much guaranteed to work. Uh, I've never seen it not work for a site that actually sticks with it for a long time. Uh, and whenever it's not working, it's usually because they failed one of the execution elements, right? They either uh, were creating very good content, they weren't doing it consistently, or they weren't building authority. But if you can do those things, 
Uh, and it helps to get some outside eyes here, right? Or it helps to like talk to a professional for a little bit and just make sure you're doing it. But once you know how to do those three things, uh, you can have like quite a bit of success. The last element though is patience. SEO is very slow. It's a very long-term play. It's something you need to be ready to wait like a year or two to really kick in. Uh, I was able to shortcut it a little bit because I had already been writing on my site for five years. So when I published the Rome article, I, my site was already able to rank really quickly. And we're going to go look at that in a second here. But uh, if you're just getting started, you need to be ready to wait like a year or two for your site to get a lot of search traffic. So you, you just have to have that patience or else it's not going to work. Because if we look at that critical authority threshold again, you can see that there is this element of building links, but also time. It just takes a long time for some of this traffic to get in. And so you need to have that patience if you really want to start getting some of these like organic, kind of like passive income -y sales for your course. But if you do have that patience and you do stick to the plan, uh, it can really pay off in a big way. And then you've got the execution element that allows you to really turn your strategy and execution into those like magic passive SEO course sales. Uh, and so before we go into Q and A, I just wanted to show you guys the live <clears throat> example of this because I, what I talk a lot about in the course or what I talk a lot about in the presentation is how uh, you want to build up this like body of work. But one sec. If you apply that to a broader blog, then uh, what you're actually able to do is uh, create content for a bunch of different courses or a bunch of different products that can rank fairly quickly. Because if we do an incognito search and we look for uh, Rome Research, right, which is the tool that my, cor my other course is about, the, the blog post is about, you can see I'm like, what is this, number three? But I mean, number one is the product itself. Number two is their Twitter account. Then we have YouTube videos. And then we have my article right? So my article is the first like non-product result for it. And like I showed you before, that's been bringing in like almost a thousand people a day to read the article ever since I launched it. And when people come in and they read it, uh, again, going back to the strategy, right? I'm answering their question, like what is Rome and like, how does one use it? Uh, and then in answering their question, I'm going to weave in my product. So I'll show you how that works out here, right? This is just a very in-depth article about Rome. Uh, and you can see I've got a link to the course here, right? And it's fairly simple. It just says, you know, you can go here to get beta access for a discount, uh, but I'm not pushy about it. And then somebody asked about YouTube videos, right? So I've actually embedded a YouTube video here. And uh, if we go watch it on YouTube, you can see that, whoops, shh, quiet other net. Uh, this has, yeah, 25,000 views, right? And a lot of those views are actually coming from people reading the article and then watching the video, which in turn means that if we go to YouTube and we search Rome Research, uh, it actually shows up fairly high here. At least it used to. Am I wrong about this? Anyway, people are still finding it in YouTube. It could be a different, oh, there it was. Uh, it could be different search terms, but... Um, a lot of people are finding it on YouTube and finding the course that way too. So if you want to do video, this is a good way to kind of interweave them. You have the video and the article and they feed off of each other. But then as we're reading, again, like I'm not pushing the course super hard here, right? And I could push it quite a bit harder if I wanted to sell more courses off the article. But just in reading it, we had the push at the beginning. And then uh, there's another push down here saying to go check it out. But just these like just this little bit of featuring, uh, right? So got beta access for the course here. And then people, you know, they'll sign up for my newsletter. And then in my newsletter, I mentioned the course. Obviously in the YouTube videos, I mentioned the course. It doesn't take a lot uh, as long as you've got the SEO traffic coming in to really push a good number of course sales. So uh, this has worked great for me for Rome. I know it's worked really well for a lot of other teachable creators on different topics who've been able to use SEO to sell more of their courses. Uh, and it could work really well for you. So uh, we do have, uh, or we at Growth Machine have uh, a course on how to do this. Works well for companies, works great for courses. Uh, that goes through our whole like really in-depth process. Same process we use for like a lot of big companies and for our personal sites. Uh, so you can check that out. Uh, I know Teachable is running a special on it right now. So it's like 40% off. Uh, and then this is my Twitter. So it's just at Natalie. And so if you have any questions about 
SEO, marketing, whatever, like super happy to answer them there. But we've also got some time now. So uh, why don't we like hop into some of those other questions? Or we could even do some live stuff too, if, uh, if it makes sense. All right, great. Uh, so let's take a look at the chat here. So you had like a bunch of good questions here. And before we dive into those, I just wanted to say that was a really great presentation. And I just wanted to say that everyone here appreciates, you know, all the info that you shared. And jumping okay. straight in, we had a few questions about Medium. So TJ says, for articles, yeah. is Medium a good platform to drive traffic or should we host our own blog? And Jess, this related question, does it matter if you're publishing on sites like Medium or and if you're just linking to those articles on your own website? Should you republish as a blog on your site? Like, how does, how does that all fit together? Yep. So... I, uh, the short answer is don't publish on medium. Uh, can I share again, Cameron? Oh, go for it. Cool. All right. Uh, we've got a good article all about this. Uh, it's just, should you publish on medium? If you search like growth machine medium, you'll find the article, but basically medium owns all of your content and they hide most of it behind a paywall. Uh, and so you, and, and then because of that, it's not very good for SEO and you don't control any of the traffic. So Medium's like a really, really terrible place to be publishing articles if you want to use those articles for sales, if you want to grow your uh, your personal authority, grow your site's authority, because uh, you're really just growing Medium's authority. So strongly recommend not using Medium. Uh, I really like Webflow. WordPress is great as well. Uh, but Medium's just going to really limit what you can do uh, with turning content into course sales. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, it's much harder to rank for stuff. You don't control the CTAs. You don't have tracking pixels. You can't like uh, embed bits of your courses if you want to get fancy. It's just really, it's it's not going to serve your purposes long-term. For that. Now we had two questions about page two or kind of two comments. So um, two people actually, both of whom are named Scott, but they're not the same person say, I'm wondering if, you know, page two being as bad a place is changing. I'm finding I'm digging deeper more often. And Scott, the other Scott says, I agree um, because page one is getting squeezed by adding more sponsored posts, local results, video products, etc. So have you seen, in fact, page two is like a little bit more valuable now than it used to be? Not really. I mean, we're, we're looking at a ton of these results every week for all of our clients and it's really, you know, 90% of the traffic still goes to the top five spots. So if you're not in those top five spots, you're competing for less than 10% of the total available traffic. Uh, you can definitely get some traffic if you're not on page one and you might not be on page one for a main keyword, but you might be on page one for like a long tail variation of that. Because uh, one thing to keep in mind is it's something like 80% of all, and this blows my mind, but like 80% of all Google searches are unique in the sense that they're like long strings of text that have never been searched before in that combination. So when we do this keyword research and we say, oh, you know, there's 450 searches a month for branding photography, uh, there's probably four times as many searches as that for variations on branding photography that we wouldn't think of, right? It's people searching for like, uh, what is branding photography and how can I use it in my business, right? Like this is a keyword that's never gonna show up in Google, but a lot of these same results are probably the same ones that show up if we just search brand photography, right? Yeah, so this was like result three or four before, um, like a number of these are still the same. Right. So uh, one thing that, you know, could be happening is you might be on the second page for the head keyword branding photography, but then you could actually show up number one, two, or three for a very long tail variation and see some traffic from that. But yeah, I mean, typically you just want to aim to be as high as possible because the higher you are, the more traffic you're going to get. Um, and being on the second or third page is unlikely to drive much unless you've got a crazy high volume keyword. Great. That makes sense. Now, I, I appreciate how much detail you're giving here. And somebody actually has a question about the course. So mm -hmm. you know, how different is the course from what you're talking about today? And by the way, the course should be available if you click the button right above the video. Um, so if you're watching the video right now, there should be a button right above it. You can click to buy the course at what Light Nat said. We're getting, it's, it, it's a special price. So do you want to tell everyone a little bit about what they're going to get in the course versus just, you know, even like the details you got today in the overview? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, today in the overview was... Um, was very philosophical, right? So when we're talking about 
uh, some of these execution stuff, like creating great content, publishing consistently, increasing authority, or when we're talking about uh, like finding customer problems, answering their questions. The course actually has like detailed videos and spreadsheets and search queries and like videos on how to use the tools and everything you need to do to actually go out, compile all of this research, figure out exactly what keywords you should be targeting, how you should order those keywords, how much you should publish, how to figure out exactly how to make the best content. Uh, based on what you're publishing, how to promote that content and get initial traffic on it, how to track and improve your results over time. So whereas this today was kind of like the philosophical introduction, the course is like tactical step-by-step. -step. It's literally you looking over my shoulder as I do all of this for a uh, tea company and then giving you all the tools you need to go and duplicate that success for yourself. And all of the work that I did in the course we actually applied to a website and that website went from zero to 150,000 visitors a month in eight months. So it's like a very tactical, very like step-by-step, -step, here's what you do and how you do it course. Uh, so that you could go apply this for yourself. The tactics that make the difference. Um, now, one thing that uh, I see here is a good question. Um, so Sam has something a little bit different. He says, do you have any local search strategy and, and tips for in-person class sales? If you're doing something local, how relevant are you know, the materials and the structure, what you're talking about going to be? Yeah, I would not buy my course if you're focused on local SEO. Uh, it's not really what the course is about. It's about, you know, like, it's great if you're doing an online course or e-commerce store or something like that, where you can have a national reach. If you need to be more local, it's just not going to be a good fit for you. Uh, I don't know that much about local SEO, honestly. I know a bit because my wife and I opened a cafe and we had to figure some stuff out there, but I haven't really created any materials on it. So uh, I'd have to direct you somewhere else. All right. And I appreciate you being upfront about that instead of just being like, yeah, buy my course. There's all this stuff <laughs> local in there. Yeah. I mean, uh, like the, the articles can help some with local. And I mean, we, we did get some foot traffic in our cafe from articles we'd written, but I wouldn't. I mean, it's just, it's not a good ROI for like a local business to be investing that much in like national appeal, like articles and content and whatnot. It's not where I would focus. Yeah. So one thing that's kind of curious, like I've got a good question here from John, because I think there's a lot you can dive into with this. He says, how would you use SEO to sell services that are broad, like writing or graphic design? Is it about niching down? Is it about, uh, how, how do you go about finding um, your success here? Yeah, I mean... So Growth Machine is a marketing agency, right? And this is my, my primary job is I run this marketing agency. And a lot of the people who found Growth Machine come from like articles that we've written and like stuff we've talked about on the blog, right? Uh, so whatever kind of uh, service business you're doing, you can actually, you know, you could go through the course and you could apply the same methodology to talking about uh, whatever it is your company does. So if it's like a writing service company, you could be talking about like creating good writing and creating good content for your site. Uh, you'd be, we'll be competing with each other, but you could do that. <laughs> um, or if you're doing photography stuff, right? You could be talking about, you know, great photography and choosing a wedding photographer and, you know, staging a wedding photography or like any of those things, right? Uh, basically anytime you have a business where uh, people would like to see some authority or some expertise before they buy from you. Content could be really powerful because, you know, for us, we're doing these monthly retainers and it's fairly expensive to work with the agency. And so if people can read, you know, some of the stuff we know beforehand, that actually helps a lot with the sales process and it helps people find the site. So if you're doing a service business, I mean, I can't really recommend content marketing highly enough because it's been massive for us. It's like at Growth Machine, we don't run any ads. We don't, we haven't done any marketing. We hired our first marketing person like two weeks ago. Uh, all of our, all of our leads have come inbound to us without us having to go get leads. They've just come to us because of our blog and because of like our content marketing and our SEO work. So it's great for attracting customers. I'm just curious what the first step for you is, you know, with a, with a, with a marketing person on board, any, any ideas on that? I. Uh, Say that again. Like, what's the first step? Well, if, when you now you have a marketing person on board, any ideas on how you're gonna uh, turbocharge it? 
Yeah, I mean, so step one, obviously, is just going to be doubling down on what's already working for us, right? It's like content and SEO have been phenomenal for getting us this far. So we want to like double down and take that even further. I mean, you can look at the blog here and this is very sporadic. Like there have been six posts since September, 2019. It is not my main priority. So like, I'm not doing a good job maintaining the blog. I'm not following my own advice here, right? Uh, <laughs> what I'm saying published consistently, like I haven't had time to do it, uh, but so like really focusing on getting that more locked in, uh, getting our email marketing going, getting a lot of our social stuff going. Uh, and then she's going to be able to explore all the stuff we haven't had time for, right? Like maybe we want to do a webinar with you guys at Teachable, right? Uh, maybe we want to reach out to other marketing companies and work with them. Maybe we want to get more guest posts from other experts in the industry. Uh, it's, it's pretty exciting because we've like been able to get this far without focusing too much on it. And now we can like really double down on what's worked and explore some new areas. Cool. Now, Whitney has a good question here. Um, Whitney says, how would you best approach finding a strategy for keywords that are very difficult? Would you just keep mm -hmm. trying to find more related niche keywords? Uh, well, we could do this live. Whitney, what is the keyword you're thinking about? Or what's the area you're thinking about? Yeah, Whitney, drop that in the chat. Um, and so I know that we're a couple of seconds delayed from here. So I'll wait for that to come in. Uh, I know that I can answer Gustavo's question. He says, regarding your online course, will it teach us how to use SEO to sell online courses? Um, well, I, I know that some of the techniques in the in the course are relevant to online courses, uh, but Nat is the it's definitely something you could use for an online course. Oh yeah, it, it's not it's not specifically about using it for online courses, but it's using it for any product. The idea is you have a product you want to sell. How do you use SEO to sell that product, and how do you build a blog that you can use to like turn into passive sales for your product? So yeah, whether that product is a course or services business or an e-commerce business, the strategy is essentially the same. So Whitney's responding to the chat. Whitney is an app maker, oh. uh, mobile, mobile and web apps. Mobile and web apps. All right. So, I mean, the first thing we probably look at, right, is like mobile app development. And yeah, I mean, so this is going to be pretty hard, right? If we just start with this, right? We're looking at $45 cost per click. Oof. Uh, 66 difficulty, also oof. Um, 7.2 thousand. Uh, searches, which is like fine, but uh, this ratio is worrisome, right? Like it's going to be super hard to compete on and it's not a crazy volume. So what I would look at is, you know, one thing I would think about is uh, what types of apps do a lot of people come to and like what kind of case studies could you do? So could you write articles about how you built a blank app, right? Like how to build a like recipe app or something, right? Because what I'm thinking you might want to try, so, okay, not much here, but what you might want to try is thinking about what are people searching when they either think they could maybe build it themselves or they're debating whether to hire someone. So how to build different kinds of apps or like build recipe app or things like that might be kind of interesting because some people will be looking to build it themselves. Others will be looking to hire someone. Or you could look like how much does an app developer cost, right? Because a term like that, still decently high difficulty, fairly low volume. So this might not be the best term, but what if we look at hire an app developer, right? Okay, now we're getting somewhere a little more interesting. Difficulty is quite a bit lower. Volume is still kind of low though, so we'd have to like play around with it. But uh, how about this? How much does it cost to build an app, right? So this is a good volume. The cost per click is low, so there's less commercial intent, but the difficulty is still kind of high. So what's, once we've got this, something I might do is, and basically, and everything I'm doing right now, this kind of ideation is a whole part of the course, right? Like taking stuff that's hard and finding the easier opportunities within it. So maybe we could say like, what, what does this also rank for? And see if we find any gold in here. Um, you know, not much, not much, right? Like we're seeing some stuff about specific apps. What is app? Um, these are all pretty broad terms, right? Like, and you might, you might also just find that it's like a pretty tough area and then you're gonna have your work kind of cut out for you. And so far it's looking like this is, kind of tough. How to create a game app. That's not a bad keyword. Just cost to build a computer. That's not right. Uh, what about like search suggestions, right? We can go through here. We can see if anything pops up. Um, cost to hire someone to build an app. So this one's quite a bit better, right? We're down to 24. 
uh, versus 200. But it this is seeming like it would be difficult unless you can find some, you know, some other areas to focus in on. Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. This is an area I know that well, so a little tough. But you would want to kind of sit with it for a little bit and say, okay, what are all the other problems this person's trying to solve? Uh, or what else could they be interested in doing? And then like, what else can we write about that might be a little bit easier to rank on? But first glance, this looks like it could be a tough area. So you might have to do quite a bit of authority building to be competitive. That was a good one. And I appreciate you, you diving in depth of that. We had some people actually timing in, in the chat in depth. They're saying, Niall says, I actually rank super high for these terms. Um, their site promotes no code tools rather than building ourselves. We talk about how oh, folks cool. can do it themselves, top three tools, that kind of thing. And John had some suggestions. He's like, you know, how to build a Twitter clone or something might be, might be, good, for, might be good for Whitney. Oh, yeah. uh, you're going to get lots of people with uh, links to parlor there. Um, yeah, this is actually a great keyword. Twitter clone, how to build a Twitter clone doesn't have that much volume, but a lot of difficulty. It's, it's kind of fun. I don't know. I enjoy doing this. It's kind of like a, an adventure or like a treasure hunt, right? <laughs> You're like trying to find the random low, low difficulty, high volume keywords. Cool. And when you find a good set of them, it's like striking gold because it's sort of like free traffic and money if you get it right. Francisco, I, you, I noticed that you have a question about the discount not being automatically applied. Um, make sure to apply the coupon code DISCOVER. So type in DISCOVER in the coupon code area for, to activate the discount. Sorry, sorry about that. It was uh, missing from the link for some reason. Um, all right, so we had, I know we had uh, some more questions in here. So uh, Sig has a question. Does Google register someone reopening a window then finding your, for your article again versus keeping your article open in a window and referencing backs? So, like how does Google actually track that behavior versus like, oh, I'm looking at this as interesting. Let me open a new tab and search for this as well while keeping your window open. Like how does it actually get penalized or is it ultimately a little bit of a black box? Yeah, it's a black box and we don't really know. I, I The best we can do is kind of use our intuition here. So I think that both of those situations help you because either they kept the page open for a long time and, you know, kept looking at it and, you know, Google knows if you're like scrolling on the page and things like that. So it can tell when you're looking at it versus not. Uh, and so that helps if you're keeping it open. But then also if you close it and keep coming back to it, that also tells Google it was pretty useful, right? The main thing that you don't want is somebody showing up on your page looking at it for 10 seconds and then leaving and going and clicking on another result. Like that definitely hurts you. But whether they leave it open or they keep coming back to it, that should be good for you either way. Okay, cool. So I think we should probably take one or two more questions here before we wrap this up. I want to be respectful of your time. So Madison says, I've checked my authority with a few different places, uh, Moz, Neil Patel, SEO review tools and seeing different numbers. Uh, do you have a recommended site to check? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I like ARS for everything. I just like keeping it all in one place. Moz is great too. Uh, they're probably the other one that I would look at um, and take seriously, but those are really the only two that I would use. Nice. And TJ says, if you don't have the luxury of time, can publishing more content speed up the process? Uh, yeah. Definitely. Um, you just need to find somebody to help you with it. And actually, if you, if you have the budget, I would always recommend hiring a writer instead of doing it yourself because odds are like writing is not your job. It's not your main thing. It's going to fall by the wayside. So just find, you know, a really good freelance writer or good freelance writers to help you do that because it's going to make it so much easier. Um, and if that is something that you want, like this is another service that we do at Growth Machine, which is just the writerfinder.com. And so we've got like relationships with 5,000 some professional writers. And so we can kind of like take whatever uh, topics you want to write about and get you a good group of writers to like help you create that content. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you really want to invest in doing your content marketing and you know, you're not going to have time to write it, then it's just finding a good freelance writer is going to help a lot. All right. Now, I think that that's it for the webinar today, but everyone, I think what we should do to finish this up, could you just all in the chat say thank you to Nat for sharing, you know, all his knowledge with us today? Well, not all the knowledge, you'll have to get the course to, <laughs> to get all of that. Um, but for, you know, his generosity, his time, and for, you know, really teaching us something new. So if you could just say thank you in the chat to Nat, Unintentional Rhyme, 
and, and <laughs> looking at TJ saying, thank you, that was awesome, Madison, Manfred, Sig, Mar Marina. So I think that everyone it got a lot out of this, and I really hey, appreciate everyone's time. Cameron, Anything else you want to I add? mention one more thing? Of yeah, course. I was just going to yeah, say, um, I know the course is like a tad on the expensive side for some people. So if you're kind of like unsure about it, we have a free version. Like it's not nearly as in depth, but uh, it will kind of like give you a sample of it. So if you just go to growthmachine.com slash free course, this will have like a couple of the lessons. Um, obviously the free course or the, the paid course goes way more in depth than this, but uh, if you're looking at it and you're kind of like not sure, this is a not a bad starting point as well. All right. Well, thank you to everyone for joining us. Your time as well means a lot.